Can y'all see my slides? Yes, we can. All right, let's see. Do you see this now? Yep. You see ultrasound, you, uh, ultrasound basics? Everybody see that? Okay, yes. perfect. Uh, we hit play. So this is, I'm, I'm like literally jumping into a, uh, a, a different lecture uh, only because I want to make sure we're, when I start talking terms, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly where all of you are on the spectrum of learning ultrasound. So I just want to make sure we have kind of like the terminology, black, white, these kind of types of things. And I'll just breeze through this quickly. If you have questions, feel free, bring it up. Uh, so kind of terminology, right? So you'll hear a lot of people talk about echogenicity. Echogenicity is the color, okay? This is like the black, white scale. Let me uh, quick. Let me come out of this real quick. I gotta uh, minimize you guys. Uh, so echogenicity is basically the black-white scale. So you'll hear people say hyperechoic, anechoic, isoechoic. Uh, so it's all about black and white, right? So that's something that's very important. So if someone says hyperechoic, that just means there's more echogenic than the surrounding tissue. So you guys, my pointer doesn't work, but that dot in the middle, it's white. So that's hyperechoic, meaning it's white, uh, compared to the surrounding structure, which is hypoechoic compared to that spot. Uh, so hyperechoic means white. Anechoic is black, right? So that space in between there, that's a black structure that's called anechoic or absent of echoes. Basically what happens here is the echoes, the ultrasound waves travel through a structure then uh, they have no issue uh, with traveling through that structure. So you think about fluid filled structures such as the eyeball, you know, the liver, et cetera. A lot of times those ultrasound waves have no ability or no issues with traveling through that uh, structure. And so it's fluid filled. So if you think about an abscess or you think any of that thing like that, a vessel, right? Those are going to be anechoic. It's going to be black. So that's important to know. Isoechoic is just anything, uh, the surrounding structures, it's more of like the gray scale. Uh, this quick body planes, you'll talk about a lot of, there's a lot of conversation in ultrasound when it comes to like the transverse and the sagittal, right? So the transverse meaning obviously uh, the plane that cuts the body in half. Uh, left and right versus head to toe, obviously be sagittal. So you'll hear people talk about that a lot. Something to remember when we're uh, obviously using ultrasound. So this is a CT cut, uh, you know, so basically if you put the ultrasound on top and you shine the ultrasound down towards the vertebral body, the red dot is the indicator. So you guys can see my pointer, correct? Yes. Perfect. So this red, in, in this red dot is the indicator. Every probe has an indicator on it, and it's important to always put it towards either the patient's right or the head, unless we're doing like a cardiac ultrasound, which we don't have to worry about. Uh, we're obviously not teaching technique, uh, but this little spot here corresponds to that indicator. So this is the vertebral body, right? This is obviously the aorta on top of the vertebral body. So the ultrasound waves come in. Uh, and they go all the way through, they hit some of the spine. It's, you can see the spine here, so that hyperechoic. So anything that's hyperechoic and white, it's gonna have a high calcium content, meaning essentially all the way, all the uh, ultrasounds, when they hit that structure, they're absorbed uh, and they're or refracted back to the ultrasound machine. Nothing will get past it. So a lot of times it'll cast this shadow behind it. This isn't casting a shadow so, so much, but you'll see that like where if this is the bone, everything past it, will be a shadow because none of the ultrasound waves can get past high density structures such as bone. So this is the aorta. And obviously this is all the tissue uh, anterior, right? So this is where the probe is. This is where the spine is. And like the feet are coming towards us and the head is into the screen. This is the sagittal, right? So if I put the ultrasound on the belly uh, and I put the indicator towards the patient's head, obviously this is the, uh, the lumbar spine, the sacrum, right? You see the bladder here. This is obviously a CT. So this is now the ultrasound equivalent that we're seeing here. So this is the spine here, right? So the head's over here, the feet are down here. This is the spine. This is the uh, aorta, obviously. You can see some of the liver tissue up here. And this is obviously the indicators to this side. So that means it's going towards the head because that's where we have the indicator pointing. So this is your sagittal. A lot of times you, people will call it sagittal long axis, right? It's not cross-sectional. It's more the tubular structure of what you're looking at. <laughs> Uh, this is what we call coronal, right? So when we do the FAST exam, you'll put it on the side uh, indicator towards the axilla, right? To up toward the, the right head. Uh, and it's essentially like you're taking the front half of the body off, right? And so you're, you're getting that coronal slice. And this is what that looks like. And we'll feel when we do the FAST or the uh, rush lecture, you'll see it. But essentially, this is the liver. 
This here is the, the diaphragm, okay? The lung would be up here, the head here, the feet down here, right? And so essentially this is like the coronal. So if we, we were cutting through here, so we literally cut this, take this entire half of the body, this anterior half away, uh, this is the structure. And you'll see on my lecture, I have some pretty good slides for animation purposes. This just talks about resolution. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about this. Uh, high frequency versus low frequency. So you'll hear people talk about probes. So a linear probe, which is used for like vascular purposes, ocular, uh, muscle, uh, musculoskeletal, soft tissue. It's all, it's a, called a high, it's a linear probe. It's high frequency. So it's like, if I was to say the way to compare it into layman's terms, it's like high definition, right? Very crisp, very good, very clear structure. But just notice these are in centimeters. So we're at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're about eight centimeters deep. So a high linear or a high frequency linear probe, it doesn't have a lot of depth. It's really good for soft tissue, vascular and stuff like that. So you can see someone's poking a needle in right there. Versus the curvilinear probe or the phase array, just the other two probes we use for the abdomen and the cardiac probe. Uh, you can see it's not as clean, Chris. It's almost like if this is like 1080p, you know, this is like 720 or something. Like it's just not as clean, but uh, we can get a lot more depth. So low frequency, uh, echoes are going to give us a lot more depth. It's not going to be as clean and crisp versus high frequency, really clean, really crisp. It just doesn't travel as far. <clears throat> so basically, this is just showing you what happens, right? So as the, uh, the attenuation, so this is the intensity and the amplitude. When the ultrasound waves, this is all the physics, so it's not that important, but it basically comes in, hits a structure, and uh, the machine, let me see if I can get a better slide here. So the machine knows exactly as like it absorbed, meaning it's, you know, everything's absorbed. Nothing goes back to the, the probe. Is it refl uh, reflected? Obviously it hits a structure and goes back to the probe or is it refracted, right? So it will ricochet essentially and go in a different direction. And then scatter basically can go in all directions. This is your tissue. So water, blood, fat, liver, and muscle and bone. This is going from uh, your less dense tissues all the way to your upper, uh, the higher density. So the higher density, these are gonna be more hyperechoic. Uh, water, obviously fluid is gonna be anechoic. Uh, so this is just kind of your attenuation and why uh, the echoes appear the way they do. Um, make sure that's really it. So a good example of, we don't have to look at all this, this is just some other, physics. And we're about to get out of this. I just want to make sure we're all on the same because I think a lot of people tend to sometimes struggle with why things are black, white, etc. Let me see. So, uh, yeah, I'll come out of this. So the biggest thing is, is just know that when you're looking at an ultrasound and say the, the ultrasound waves come off this probe, uh, the machine knows when the ultrasound wave comes down and it hits and then it goes back to the probe, the probe says, oh, you're, you took an X amount of time before you return to the probe. So I'm going to plot you here, you know, and some echoes continue. They take longer to re uh, reflect and go back to the probe. They're like, oh, okay, you took a little bit longer. So I'm going to plot you here. So that's a lot of times with depth. It all has to do with how long the probe or how long the echoes took to, you know, reflect off the tissue and go back to the probe. All right. So enough of physics. We'll flip over to our lecture. Any, any questions about any of that? Now we're going to get into like the clinical aspect of ultrasound. No questions. It's kind of boring. It's not fun, but it's important stuff when you're del delving into a lecture if you have it understood exactly why things look the way they do. Uh, but obviously, feel free as you guys, uh, as we go forward, if you have questions. So the rush exam, so the FAST exam stands for Focused Assessment of Sonography and Trauma. And obviously, the last word there is trauma. So the FAST is always used in basically any traumatic accident, right? So whether it's a penetrating trauma, or blunt trauma, right? Like a blunt force, like NVA, whatever. Uh, people will use the FAST exam looking for obviously fluid uh, inside the abdomen, you know, the thorax or pericardial effusion. Uh, and then we developed the EFAST, which is the extended FAST. Uh, and then we would look at endomethorosy. Uh, and essentially that was the guinea pig. It was adopted, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s by ATLS, which is the Advanced Trauma Life Skills. Uh, and uh, that was kind of where point of care ultrasound really took off. Uh, over time, we've developed other opportunities to learn how to use the ultrasound to better understand, you know, what else could be going on. And so 
the rush exam came out of that and the rush stands for rapid ultrasound and shock and hypotension so yes you can think about a trauma patient that comes in there's a very good chance they could be in hemorrhagic shock there's a very good chance they could be hypotensive so the fast exam is a part of the rush exam the rush exam the reason i like teaching this is a little bit more than the fast is because it tells you a little bit more of um a little bit more about what's going on with the patient so the fast is kind of like okay are they bleeding in the belly are they bleeding in the chest are they bleeding around the heart you know they have an thorax, and that's it right the rush exam looks at the other medical reasons why you could be hypotensive right uh and that's kind of what i like to use this lecture because it's kind of a more broad encompassing lecture and it touches on more topics uh so the background uh this is kind of funny like it's called rush it's you know it's obviously it's a catchy name uh, at UC Davis, where actually where I trained for ultrasound, they they first came up with this protocol and they just called it the UHP protocol, which you know stood for undifferentiated hypotensive uh, patient. Uh, and subsequently, these guys didn't get any credit because it was just poor marketing. Uh, and shortly thereafter, uh, other studies came out uh, that are very uh, infamous for uh, the rush exam. And this is where it kind of took off. And this is the one that a lot of people reference. Uh, the study where uh, they indicated uh, or showed indications for the rush exam. So uh, the way we break it down is basically first we think about the pump, the tank, and the pipe. So obviously the pump's the heart. The tank is you think about the IVC, uh, you know, and then the pipes you think about, or and also you know the the pleural uh, the pleural and the peritoneal cavity. Uh, so those obviously the abdomen and the thorax, and then the pipes is the uh, uh, aorta, and also you think, could think about a DVT, which is an indirect marker, and we'll get to that. Uh, so we're going to talk about the pump, the tank, the pipes first, and then I'm going to teach you guys kind of the mnemonic that we like to use and kind of the approach that we uh, basically use this exam. So the first, the pump. So talking about the heart. So remember, we're doing an ultrasound in a patient that's hypotensive or in shock, and we don't know why, right? So this is rapid ultrasound uh and shock and hypotension but it's undifferentiated meaning we have no idea why this patient's hypotensive uh and so at this first thing we like to do you think about okay well what's the most important organ that we need to intervene on immediately if it's the cause of the hypotension of course is the heart so things that we want to think about an effusion right so if you have a pericardial effusion obviously which could lead to tamponade uh, and that's going to give you hypotension the squeeze of the pump meaning the contractility right is this patient uh, is their ejection fraction uh, sustainable or is it is it good enough or adequate enough to sustain, uh, you know, perfusion? And so you think about someone that's in like cardiogenic shock, you know, you're going to see a heart that's not pumping appropriately. Therefore, they're going to have hypotension. And then, of course, the strain, which is you think about someone that has a, a pulmonary embolus. So if you have a pulmonary embolus in the lungs, the heart's pumping against that pressure, right? So that the pulmonary pressures have acutely risen secondary to this uh, pulmonary embolus so that the heart's really going to be straining against the, the uh, pressures in the lungs. That's the strain of the pump. So how do we look at this? So when we're doing a, a cardiac ultrasound or an echo, right? Uh, there's four different views. So there's a parasternal long axis, a parasternal short axis, an apical four chamber, and a subxiphoid. Uh, that's for a complete echo, right? So if we're going to go look at a patient with chest pain, you know, I'm going to do a full echo on that patient. Uh, it's not comprehensive like the cardiologist would do or the echo cardiographer, uh, echo, uh, echo tech, you know, but at least I can get a lot of information. When we're doing uh, the cardiac views in the setting of like uh, for a rush exam, I don't need all four views. I really just need to answer the three questions we just talked about. Is there a pericardial effusion? Is the heart contracting? you know, adequately, and it, it, could there be a PE, and I could not find any indirect markers uh, that a PE could be the cause of why maybe this patient's hypotensive. Um, and so we're going to talk about the different views. And so you can look on the bottom right there. Uh, the ultrasound obviously is going to go on the left side of the chest. We call this like, it's the parasternal long, right? So it's the left of the sternum, but it's parasternal. Uh, and all the views, basically the parasternal long, the short axis, uh, or the parasternal short axis, it all has to do with the rotation of the probe. We don't have to worry about that. I just want you guys to understand it's all manipulation of the probe rotating. And then you can see the marker C marker, uh, that's the apical four. And then the B marker, uh, that's the subxiphoid. So uh, where the ultrasound is on A, that's where you get your parasternal long and short axis, C, apical four, and B is for the subxiphoid. So what are these, uh, so that's, we're gonna talk about what that looks like next. 
so then we're going to move on to the tank. Uh, so you think about the tank. Obviously, first and foremost, the IBC, right? So the IBC, a lot of times uh, at your level, you think, okay, IBC, is it, you know, when you're looking at it, is it collapsible or is it plethoric, right? Is it a fat IBC with no respiratory variation or is it a compressible, collapsible IBC? At your level, and when I was in your shoes, I always thought, okay, well, this is a marker of kind of like, is someone hydrated enough, right? So is this, uh, if it's collapsible, they're dehydrated. If it's plethoric, you know, then they're hypervolemic. And that's not really true because the IVC, you got to remember, is a low pressure system. So there's going to be a lot of movement with the IVC. Uh, so just re kind of remember that as we go forward, and I'll teach you guys how to uh, assess an IVC. Uh, the leakiness of the tank. Obviously, this is bleeding into the abdomen or the thorax, which is obviously all of your fast windows, and we'll talk about that. Tank compromise. Uh, we're going to look at the lung windows. So this is how you're going to rule out a pneumothorax. Uh, you know, obviously, if a pneumothorax happens, and that's not going to cause hypotension, but if it subsequently develops into a tension pneumo, you know, eventually as you have medial stinal shift and it continues to move over, it's going to essentially uh, impede flow or venous return, and that's where you're going to get your hypotension. And of course, tank overload, meaning congestive heart failure, right? So over time, as you know, you remember the Frank Sterling curve or whatever, the Frank Sterling curve, as the myocytes are uh, overextended, you're going to end up getting tank or a cardiac compromise, and that's going to eventually put fluid into the lungs. And so we can look at the lung to appreciate B lines, which is a, a marker of pulmonary edema. And then the pipes are easy. That's basically looking at the aorta, uh, looking for aortic aneurysm or an aortic dissection. And then lastly is clogging of the pipes. So that's a DVT. Can anybody answer me? Does a DVT cause hypotension? I'd say no. Fantastic. A DVT does. I thought I lost everyone there for a second. <laughs> Either I put everyone to sleep <laughs> or I'm just. I did not know the answer, so I was just being quiet. Uh, good. No, I, we, and as we're going forward, I'm asking more questions. So I want you guys to interact. This is, I'll put you to sleep if, uh, if you don't interact. So DVT does not cause hypotension, right? So DVT is an indirect marker for someone that's hypotensive secondary to a PE. So when you're doing like this rush exam, like some people will say, hey, well, if they're hypotensive and you can't appreciate a good echo, maybe you should look for a DVT. Uh, I don't teach that, but that's something that some people will, will talk about. All right. So this is uh, what every patient we see in the emergency department looks like. Uh, and this is kind of our approach. So we call this high map. All right, and so what this stands for, all the different markers that we're gonna look at. So we have the H, the I, the M, uh, A, and P, okay? And so this is kind of going through it. Let me go get it faster here. I'm gonna point these out so you guys know what we're looking at. All right, good. So the H is the heart. Uh, let me go back. Uh, they had to come so this is showing the hearts. So the first at the personal long axis, then the apical four. The I is the IVC. That's the marker right there in the middle off to the right. Uh, the M, which stands for Morrison's pouch. So that's your fast. That's the, the left upper quadrant, the right upper quadrant, and the suprapubic mark, which is down below. A is aorta. So that's the mark right there in the middle, uh, just to the left of the IVC. And then lastly, you saw the two marks on the chest, which is the uh, pulmonary, which stand obviously is what the P stands for. And that's looking for uh, a pneumothorax. All right. So let's go through. Uh, I don't want to keep jumping back and forth when we get through this. And we can go to the heart and then we can kind of look at what. I had this lecture on, on the desktop at work. I'm using it off my Apple MacBook, so it's definitely a little bit different. I don't remember all these stepwise markers. All right, so looking at the hearts, this is the H. So we have H for heart, I for IVC, M for Morrison's pouch, which is a fast exam, and then A for aorta, and then P for pulmonary. All right, so the heart. So these are your four different views. So we talked about the parasternal long axis. That's the view up in the upper left here. All right, so this is the parasternal long axis. This is the short axis. Uh, this is the apical four, and this is the subxiphoid. So I, we talked about we only need two views to really appreciate if their patient's heart is contracting appropriately. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this subxiphoid, and we're going to get rid of the parasternal short axis. And don't worry, we'll do it in the future. If you guys are all excited about echo, 
I'll come back and do an echo lecture and teach you all about the heart and give you a full rundown, all the views and stuff. So I'm just going to break this down quickly. So this is the, the left atrium. This is the left ventricle here. That flapping, that's the uh, mitral valve. All right. This is the left ventricular outflow track. This is the aortic valve here. And this is the RV. Okay. So LA, LV, the left ventricular outflow, and the RV. All right. So those are all important structures. This is the apical four chamber. So this is where it's out kind of down towards the apex of the heart. So through your probes up here. Right, so this is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle, this is the interventricular septum, this is the right ventricle, and this is the right atrium. Okay, so these are the two views that we're about to look at, and I'm going to teach you guys how to look at these, not necessarily look at them, acquire them, but most importantly, how to interpret them and why they matter, all right? Questions about that? All right, so when we're looking at that parasternal long axis view, the things, once again, we have to ask ourselves, pericardial effusion, yes or no, right? So ultrasound is very important. Remember, this is not a comprehensive exam. This is yes, no questions. Is there a pericardial effusion? Yes or no, right? Is there a good left ventricular cardiac function? Yes or no, right? Is there aortic root size? Meaning, is there a dilated aortic root? Meaning, could there be an aneurysm or dissection? Yes or no, right? Those are all the questions that we're going to ask on this one particular view. All right, so this is the heart in an animated form. LA, LV, LVOT, RV. All right, so you guys can appreciate the same now an ultrasound. LA, LV, LVOT, and RV. So the first thing that I always like to teach if you're looking is everybody can appreciate that this mitral valve, there's really good motion, right? So you can appreciate this mitral valve is, is trying to slap this interventricular septum. So that you're looking at the motion of the mitral valve. Other things that you want to look for to appreciate good cardiac function are the walls of the left ventricle. So appreciate that these walls are shortening and coming together. It's closing that space, right? So if there's a bunch of blood in here, we need these walls to get as close as possible to touch, to eject all that blood out of the left ventricle into the LVOT, you know, obviously out into the aorta. So everybody can appreciate this is a nice, healthy heart, right? We have good motion of this mitral valve, uh, and that tells us there's a good ejection refraction. We can appreciate that this left ventricle is collapsing down. It's closing all the space, and these walls are getting nice and thick uh, when it contracts as those myocytes contract. And so that's telling us there's a good, healthy heart movement there. Other structures that you need to know, really, the other one is th this little dot right here. This dot where my mouse is, that's the descending aorta coming down behind the heart, right? So our, our probe is up here. So this is the anterior aspect of the body. This is the posterior aspect of the body. So if this is the heart, just posterior running behind it is the descending aorta, right? So this is the descending thoracic aorta. And that structure is important to know when you're trying to figure out if there's a pericardial effusion. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. I want to compare that heart to this heart, right? So things that we're looking for here still, is this heart healthy? Is it moving? Do you guys think yes or no? Like, do we have good movement of a mitral valve? Do we have good movement of these walls? Uh, do you guys think this, this heart's moving okay? I think the valve is moving okay, but the ventricle, the muscles don't seem to be coming as close together. Fantastic. I agree. So this mitral valve is moving appropriately. I do agree. I also agree that these walls are not coming together. We definitely have some space throughout here. So I would agree that this is not a perfect, healthy heart. There's definitely could be something going on. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, I agree that this is all moving appropriately. So here's the structure I just spoke on. This is the descending aorta. Do you guys appreciate this anechoic fluid right here? Do y'all see that? Everybody sees this fluid right here? So see how this fluid is anterior or superficial to that descending aorta? That's how you know that's a pericardial effusion. So if you're ever looking for a, in a parasternal long axis and you see that this long axis view, you see the uh, descending aorta and then you see fluid anterior. So just above it, that's around the heart. And there's other views, right? We're not just gonna look at one view or two views. But nonetheless, this is how you know that's a, a, a pericardial effusion. Uh, so everybody can appreciate that. And you can also see some up here as well, right? So this is the, the right ventricle here. You can appreciate there's some fluid up here as well. So I'm sure it's circumferential all around the apex, right? So there's definitely a pericardial effusion, you know? So if you're thinking about someone, you know, could they have some type of uh, reduced, uh, you know, ejection fraction secondary to this pericardial effusion? You know, could they have some, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, future of tamponade if this you know, pericardial effusion continues uh, to develop or to expand. So that's good. All right, next uh, ultrasound. What do you guys see here? See a large pericardial effusion. <laughs> that is correct. So if this is a trauma patient, this patient's dead. Uh, I can assure you this is a medical patient. And the reason I know that is because once again, we, we know the body does an extremely uh, good job at compensation. So uh, a tamponade uh, will occur with a very little amount of fluid in the acute setting. So if it's a traumatic pericardial effusion, it doesn't take much blood to impend, uh, you know, so it basically causes RV diastolic collapse where the RV collapses during diastole when it should be filling. Uh, and that doesn't take a lot of fluid, but this is a ton of fluid, right? So you can imagine this is, you got your Delta EKG, you're going to have all the things, right? You're going to have your electrical alternates. This heart is literally just swinging left and right in this pool of fluid. So this is a large pericardial fusion. You're not going to miss that. You're obviously going to see it. Uh, still, in a medical patient, you know, over time, if that effusion gets larger, it definitely can impede on the, the uh, systolic function of the heart. So it's something that definitely we want to consider you know, go back, look at the previous echo and see if it was a trace pericardial effusion or mild pericardial effusion, because, you know, this is extensive. Uh, so this could be, you know, an issue. Good. Let's see. All right. So that's, that's all the answers, right? So we just answered, mostly we're looking at all pericardial effusions. First, we looked at a healthy heart, then a trace pericardial effusion this large. So that was all pericardial effusion, parasternal long axis, really looking at that uh, and the sinine aorta and the effusion is going to be anterior. So the reason I say that is we go back real quick. So you guys can appreciate the fluid down here, right? This is anechoic. So this is fluid. This is the descending aorta. So everybody agrees this is posterior to that, correct? It's deeper than that descending aorta. So that's the reason this is important because this is, tells me this is a pleural effusion. This is not a pericardial effusion. The pericardial effusion is anterior. If there's fluid posterior to the descending aorta, that tells me that's a pleural effusion. Right. And so that's why this is structure is very important to know anything anterior if there's fluid, pericardial, posterior, pleural effusion. All right. So that's our effusion talk. So we we can assess for a pericardial effusion in the parasternal long axis. Right. And this is very, very important in trauma. Right. So anybody that comes in with penetrating trauma, when we do the fast exam, we always start with the heart. Uh, if you do blunt trauma or blunt force trauma, you always start with the abdomen. Right, because in blunt force trauma, most commonly it's going to be a, a, the spleen. Second most common is the liver, etc. But in penetrating, we don't have an idea of where they were stabbed, where the bullet went to the abdomen, it went to the heart, whatever. But uh, obviously, a pericardial effusion that leads to tamponade is going to kill a patient much faster than bleeding into the abdomen. So we can't uh, futz around looking at the abdomen before we look at the heart because they could obviously decompensate with pulses. All right, so now the next topic inside the heart is global LV function, right? So this is basically, you know, looking at the ability of the heart and its contractility. Uh, and we're going to hit on the things that we just talked about, but it's going to kind of break it down for you guys. So organized contraction toward the center of the LV. And someone commented, they said, yeah, well, the first one, I saw the walls coming together nicely, and then they saw some space in between. So that's exactly that. We're looking for that organized contraction toward the center of the LV where all the walls come close together. Uh, then you get that myocardial thickening. And of course, with echo, there's ways to look at this, right? So there's a gross assessment. So meaning I can look at it and say, oh, that, that's about 35%, you know, ejection fraction, you know, or I can measure it. And that's what in mode uh, allows us to do. And it's called E-point septal separation. Uh, but nonetheless, we can grossly look at it. So as you do echoes, as you get comfortable in your career, the more you do them, you can guesstimate exactly, you know, and think about when you read an echo report on your on wards, when you're following up heart patients in ICU, uh, a cardiologist does an echo report and they say, oh, it's about 30, 35%. Why do they say that? Because it's a guesstimation. They're not going to measure exactly, oh, the, the EF is 37%. They're just going to give you a gross estimate, right? And that's exactly what they do. I've sat with cardiologists. I've watched them read echoes. That's exactly what they do. They just eyeball it and they say, oh, it's about 30, 35%, right? And so that's why you see that. Uh, there is an ability for us to measure it, you know, but for the most part, as emergency physicians, as everybody on this call seems to be uh, leaning towards, you know, we don't care about a, a, a slight difference. We're looking for drastic changes. We're looking for someone that had a preserved ejection fraction and now has a grossly decreased ejection fraction, right? So we're looking for those extremes. Does anybody, what does anybody want to comment on this heart? So <clears throat> this is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle, the left ventricular outflow, aortic, 
in the RV. Does anybody see anything abnormal? What do you guys think about the, the mitral valve? Is there a good motion of that mitral valve? It's slow. Good. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Let me back it up. That's my fault. I should have told you that. So this is this is slowed down so we can interpret it. Uh, I agree. It is slow. <laughs> if this is normal speed, this will definitely be bradycardic. Uh, so it's slowed down just for education purposes so we can all look at it much closer and appreciate the movement. That's all. Uh, so it's a normal, it's normal rate. Uh, it's just slow. But what about, is there anything, so you guys appreciate that the mitral valve has good movement. Everybody can agree with that, right? So this mitral valve is coming close to that septum. Therefore, we have a preserved ejection fraction. Looking at the walls, we have some good movement. Trying to see exactly how close they come together. Everything looks fine. I would say the one thing that in this view that something else you also want to consider is everybody can appreciate this is the RV. This is the left ventricular outflow going towards the aorta. And this is the LA. So there's what we call the one third rule. So you always kind of want to just look at all three of these structures. They all should be about the same size. So one third, one third, one third. And that's important because that's how you always can catch an aortic root dilatation, which could be secondary to like an aneurysm or a dissection if it's coming back into the uh, into the LVOT. Okay, so just always kind of glance when you're doing, uh, you know, these not so much in a uh, fast exam, but when you're looking at the heart, you know, you can appreciate that these should all be about the same size. And I would say you could probably maybe say that that left atrium might be a little bit uh, large, you know, compared to these two guys up here, this might be a little large. So, you know, maybe this has a little left atrial enlargement, maybe they have some, you know, mitral regurgitation or whatever. Uh, and that could be causing that, but just something to look at. All right, so I want you guys to compare this heart to this heart. What do you guys think? Why is it not going? Let me see, hold on. There you go. What do you guys think about this heart? Uh, the EF is probably low. That mitral valve is definitely <laughs> swinging. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like a little, I, I would say it's like a golf clap, right? So, yeah. you know, it's like, like that heart's making zero noise, right? So everybody can appreciate the dilatation, right? We have no movement of this large left ventricle. This little guy is like just absolutely struggling. There's no movement of that mitral valve. Right. So this is someone who's in cardiogenic shock. This is about 10, 15 percent. Right. This is what we're looking for. If you want to say the worst extreme. So someone comes in, you know, once again, clinical picture here, the patient's hypotensive. You throw the ultrasound. You know, they, this isn't necessarily trauma. This is anyone that's hypotensive. You're nice. You whatever. You throw the ultrasound on them and you see this, you can immediately diagnose that patient's in cardiogenic shock. Like there's no doubt that that's the cause of their hypotension. Uh, this patient needs some help. Right. So. Uh, that's a good assessment, right? So this is a lot, uh, or like, you know, 10, 15% versus the healthy heart we saw just prior. Does everybody see that? That makes sense. All right, so then we're going to go to the apical four chamber. Uh, so this is our second view, right? So we did the parasternal long axis. We answered if there's a pericardial effusion. Uh, we also answered as if there was any, uh, if there was good systolic function. Uh, and now we're going to go to apical four. You obviously can appreciate uh, pericardial effusion in this view, uh, but most importantly, we're just kind of looking at the overall size comparison of the two ventricles. All right, so this is sped up a little bit. Uh, sorry, this is this is not. This is obviously someone that's tachycardic. So if our ultrasound is at the apex of the heart, right? So our ultrasound's up here, looking up into the heart, uh, and then it just spins up on itself and, and it rotates. Uh, this is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. Obviously, this is the left atrium. This is the right atrium. Left ventricle, right ventricle. Left atrium, right atrium. Okay. Uh, so this is what we're looking for. So the things that we want to look for in the apical four, of course, you'll see some fluid down here. We don't see anything, so that's reassuring. Uh, and then we talked about right heart strain. So if someone comes in, they're hypotensive and hypoxic. You know, you're like, and say it's a 35 year old female on oral contraceptives. You're like, could this be secondary to a PE? This is your view, right? So you can imagine that if I put, say, you know, a healthy female, we put a, a, clot, a pulmonary embolus in their lungs, this is the right ventricle. What's going to happen to this right ventricle? Is it going to decrease in size or increase in size? Increase. Good. It's going to increase because there's not as much forward flow into the lungs, okay? 
the same idea is if you increase your afterload, right? If you increase afterload, what's going to happen to LV? It's going to dilate, right? That's why you get high left high ventricular hypertrophy over time because people that are hypertension, they're pushing up against that. So that muscle increases. Well, this is acute though. So we don't have time to, you know, have hypertrophy. Our RV is not going to have time to work out and overcome. So the only thing it can do is just obviously dilate, right? So if you ever do your apical four and you're, you know, concerned about a, uh, a pulmonary embolus, what you're looking for is RV enlargement, right? And so the, the way I like to remember it is if the entire two ventricles is one, this is one third and this is two thirds, okay? So one third, two thirds, like 0 0.33, 0 0.66, right? For a total of one. If you ever get a one-to-one -one ratio where the RV looks the same size, like a 0 0.5, 0 0.5, uh, that's bad, okay? So the RV should never compete with the LV. Uh, so if you ever see a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, that's what you're looking for. That's RV enlargement. So that's a sign of right heart strain, where this right heart is pushing up against the pulmonary pressures, secondary to pulmonary embolus. Okay. So that's what's called right heart strain. There's other things that with right heart strain uh, that we could talk about on another day when we like do an echo lecture or whatever. Uh, but that's the, the most common one that you're really looking for in the setting of uh, someone that's hypotensive. That's the first sign. There's some other advanced signs, but I won't drop them. Um, this is basically just a, a good example of that. LV, LA, RA, RV. Can you, I mean, everybody can appreciate that this LRV is similar in size to that LV, correct? Like these are very similar in size, right? And you also can appreciate some right atrial enlargement here too, right? This right atrium is enlarged. This RV is enlarged. This is more of that like 0 0.5, 0 0.5, or like a one-to-one -one ratio. So that's what you're looking for. All right, something else here. So this is LV, RV, LA, RA. Another sign of right heart strain. Does anybody see anything abnormal on this echo? It is fast. I will say that. It's definitely tachycardic. Does anybody see anything abnormal? Anything? I mean, it's not a perfect crisp echo. But does anybody see anything that's abnormal movement? Uh, I want to say it like, like the right apex is moving, but the right wall is really not moving. Do you know what that's called? That's McConnell sign, right? That's McConnell sign. Exactly. Fantastic. So he's pointing out this apex up here. So can everybody appreciate that the apex of the RV is hyperkinetic? There's a lot of motion going on up here, correct? Uh, so that's McConnell. So we talked about it's like a little man jumped on a trampoline. So that's going to cause hyperkinesis. Okay. Uh, and so that's what that's called. That's McConnell sign. So that's one, another, that's the second sign for right heart strain. That's what you're looking for. Okay. In conjunction with that, if this is moving fast, this is hyperkinetic, the free wall of the RV is gonna be hypokinetic or akinetic. And the way I like to explain this to new learners is when we bring someone in for like an ACS rule out, someone comes in with chest pain, we're like, yes, yeah, we are concerned about stenosis or thrombosis, whatever, or the development of thrombosis. We put them on a stress, we put them on a treadmill or we do a chemical stress test, right? At that point when everybody, if the patient's under uh, no duress, their heart's able to keep up. Right? We put them on a treadmill or we give them a chemical stress test. It puts the heart under duress. At that moment, the heart's not healthy enough to continue forward flow. Okay, so then what happens to the walls on the echo is you get hypokinesis or akinesis. You get that stunning at the wall, right? And then you say, okay, slow down on the treadmill and it's reversible. It slows down and then the wall continues then to come back and it, uh, it returns to normal uh, movement. So this is similar to that if I put a, a clot a blood, uh, blood clot into the lungs and give someone acute PE, you know, you can imagine with when we have RV and large that we've talked about, but it's kind of the same way. We're like, okay, at the last bit, we have hyperkinesis of the apex. This is moving great, but this wall is like stunned. There's no motion whatsoever. Uh, and we can measure that with the M mode closer. It's a different mode. Uh, and so you can measure that. And, uh, and so you can appreciate the motion of that RV, of the free wall of the right ventricle. And that's called TAPSI. Yeah, it's called it's a, a tricuspid annulus systolic plane excursion. Uh, or yeah, so it's tricuspid annulus plane systolic excursion. Uh, and so basically that's just the motion of that. So that's the third sign. So I've, I've essentially now basically done everything I told you I wasn't going to do. Uh, it's classic with ultrasound. We're like, oh yeah, we'll keep it basic. And then we just can't help. We continue to talk. But, so that's the third sign. So one sign, RV enlargement, two sign, McConnell's, three signs, TAPSI. The only other sign, is what's called D sign, right? So I'm gonna come out of this, just I gotta, at least for complete sake, if we're gonna end up uh, teaching. 
All right, so here, the, the fourth sign is if you were doing an echo, you would be able to see this short axis. So this is long axis. If you rotate 90 degrees, you'll get this view, which is the short axis. So this is what we call the fish mouth view. So this is the left ventricle as if we're a cross section looking down into the left ventricle. And this is the right ventricle here. So you can imagine if we have RV enlargement, the RV pressures increase, this is no longer going to look like an O. It's going to turn into a bow into the septum and you're going to get a D. So that's called D sign. So that's that fourth sign of right heart strain. So you have RV enlargement, McConnell's, Tapsy, which is a measurement, and then D sign. So those are your four signs uh, looking for right heart strain. Uh, would the ratio, Dr. Earl, for that last uh, PSS view, would the ratio of that one to one of the right ventricle and left ventricle still be the same in that view or not? Say it one more time. Would your ratio of that one to one being something bad, where you want actually the right ventricle to be one third compared to the left ventricle to be one third, the same rule apply yeah. in that view? Yes. So if at the end of the day, if you have someone that comes in and you have RV enlargement, so you have that one to one ratio or they're equal in size. Okay. You know, at that point, obviously you're going to kind of clinically correlate, you know, a radiologist is uh, famous last words, you know, clinically correlate. So if someone comes in, they have like COPD or pulmonary hypertension, they're going to have RV enlargement, correct? But they also are probably going to have some RV hypertrophy too, you know, okay. but once again, if you see RV enlargement, that's kind of like your first clue. The next thing after I see that is I'm going to go look for McConnell's. I'm going to do a TAPC or I'm going to look for D sign. Those are your more acute signs. Those are a little bit more sensitive, like at the end of the, or more specific, sorry, uh, for PE versus someone that has RV enlargement with hypertrophy. That's someone that obviously has pulmonary hypertension or it's going to be a little bit more chronic. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I just want to make sure that that rule applied to basically if it was a long axis or a short axis. And, oh, uh, correct. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, so uh, that the D sign is only seen in short axis. The RV enlargement, yes, you will sometimes appreciate a large RV uh, in in long axis, uh, but for the most part, you really want to look at it in the uh, in the short axis. Uh, okay. And that's I kind of cut that out, but overall, that's okay. Uh, yeah, that's something. I'm actually I didn't realize I had these hidden. I was wondering where all these animations were to help you guys understand what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, real quick, hold on. These, just, these are like so important. I was sitting here thinking like, man, this is too much talking, not enough pictures. Some of these uh, had been, some of these were on skit. Should have taken a look at this. Sorry, guys. Any questions while I'm doing this? Feel free. Was may have any questions? Uh, obviously, you guys came in uh, thinking we were probably only going to talk about the past, but I don't know. I feel like the more I, you won't, you're not going to learn all this in one sitting. But the more you get exposed to it, it's going to be far better, right? So if you're, you know, only uh, only get one aspect of things, I feel like you could you know, miss out, but the more you see it, the more it makes sense. So feel free, obviously, to, to interrupt me at any given moment. I'm just going to run through these. There's some good pictures here. I think it can might uh, help a little bit. Some of this anatomy, I should have had those unhidden. So real quick. Uh, so this is a good example if we're doing a parasternal long axis. Uh, so you can appreciate that probe. Uh, it's parasternal, so it's off to the left, and that indicator is the yellow dot. It's pointing towards the patient's right shoulder. So this is exactly how you're going to get the parasternal long axis. This is how you're going to acquire that image. Parasternal and then the indicator towards the right shoulder, okay? Uh, and this is basically now we're going to lay this patient supine. So we're into the patient's left shoulder. We're looking back over, you know, then we're going to lay them down, and it's going to give us this image which is obviously what we're seeing on ultrasound. And these are your structures. All right, so that, that's why you see exactly what you see on uh, parasternal long axis. This is that, so basically I was telling you guys about the pericardial effusion and pleural effusion. You'll hear some people refer to it as the rat tail sign. So essentially you can imagine uh, not a lot of fluid can get in between that space. It's going to be like a, a tail of fluid. And so, you know, it's called, think about ultrasound, a lot of people are on drugs and stuff like back in the day, but there's a lot of uh, animals and stuff that they refer to. So uh, we'll buzz through this. When I saw these, I just wanted to throw these animations so you guys could see it. Talk about that. 
So here's another animation. So now we've moved out to the apex, right? So our ultrasound indicator, we rotated. So we're at the right shoulder for parasternal long axis. And then you can, you're gonna rotate the indicator to the left shoulder for parasternal short axis. And then from there, we're gonna go out to the apex. Uh, and then we're gonna kind of look up into the thorax. And that's where you're gonna get that apical four. So this is like a CT cut kind of, right? So uh, the patient's obviously, we're off to the left uh, and you're looking up into the heart. Uh, so this is kind of what you, uh, how it would look from like a CT perspective. And essentially it just stands straight up and that's where you get your apical four chamber. And then the red and the, the, red and the green just kind of help you identify here uh, with the sides. <clears throat> so this is where we were. So McConnell sign, we appreciate. Any, any questions about that? So things that we matter for a quick review of the heart. So. Is there pericardial effusion? Yes or no, right? Especially in trauma, that's important. Is there good organized contraction? Meaning, does this patient have a, a preserved EF or do they have a, a depressed or reduced EF that can be leading to cardiogenic shock? And then third is right heart strain. Could this patient be, you know, hypotensive, secondary to a large PE that's causing them to have um, uh, right heart strain? Uh, that's leading to the to the hypotension. So now we're going to move to the eye, which is obviously the IBC, and look at kind of the fullness of uh, the uh, tank. So IBC things that we can consider. We're going to look for assessment of intravascular volume status and respiratory variation, and we're going to be looking for extremes. Okay. So here, how we're going to do this: our indicator goes to the midline, off to the right. Obviously, as the IBC sits off to the right of the aorta. Our indicator indicator goes to the head. So everybody understands if you ever get around an ultrasound, when I'm saying the indicator, it's that yellow dot, but every ultrasound probe will have dots or have little raised portions. So anytime you get a chance to look at an ultrasound, always look at it, flip it around and appreciate that it's always going to have a raised dot. And that refers to the indicator, which is referring to that yellow dot. So the, uh, the dot goes towards the head and off to the right. So this is the from the left shoulder. We're now we're just going to lay the patient supine, right? So now we're supine. That's the diaphragm. That obviously, the liver is above that, and the heart's to the left, right? So this is where the RA and the IBC junction, and the hepatic vein, you'll see it dumping into the IBC. We want to scan about two to three centimeters caudally uh, from that uh, hepatic vein. Uh, so if you see the hepatic vein, that's roughly about where you want to be, but you can say about two to three centimeters caudally from that, sorry, from the RA IBC junction, right? And so everybody can appreciate here, this is the liver here. This is the heart. So the patient's head is over here. Their feet are over here. They're laying supine with their head to the left of the screen, feet to the right. All right. So this is their heart. You can see the contractility over here. This is the IVC. This is the liver. Uh, and you can appreciate with the IVCs dumping straight into, uh, this is uh, the IVC dumping straight into the right atrium, which we can't get a great look at the heart. But most importantly, when we're assessing the IVC, we're looking for collapsibility, right? So everybody can appreciate that there's good collapsibility there. Uh, and this is what I was talking about. If I was the ultrasound, everybody on this call, we'd all likely have collapsible IVCs. It does not mean we're all dehydrated. It just means our venous system's not at capacity, right? So it's a very high capacity system, low, uh, low pressures. So it can tolerate a lot of fluids. So this is completely normal, right? So you'll hear people say more than 50% collapsible, less than 50% collapsible, or plethoric with no respiratory variation. So here's a physiologic question. Why does the IVC collapse with respiration, right? So when this IVC is collapsing, it's because the patient is respirating. They're having a respiration. Why is that? Can anybody tell me? I'm sure everybody on this call yeah. knows the answer. Is it because of the increased intrathoracic pressure? Increased negative. So it's like, it's really okay. decreased, right? So you think about your... Your intrathoracic pressure is negative, correct? So it becomes, with inspiration, it becomes more negative, and therefore the pressure gradient now favors uh, re venous return. So it favors flow from the AIBC into the right atrium, right? And so that's exactly right. So when you see, ask the patient to have an inspiration, you'd imagine you should see the, excuse me, you should see the IBC collapse. So that's exactly right. So here's another example, right? Can everybody appreciate the difference between the last one and this one, right? So here's the liver, heart's over here. This is the hepatic vein dumping in. This IVC is plethoric, 
right, with zero movement, right? There's, these walls are not moving, right? So this is someone that's on the opposite extreme. This is a plethoric IBC with no respiratory variation, okay? Uh, so you can appreciate that this venous system is at capacity. So why is this important? This is, this is important because at the end of the day, uh, you think about someone like this. So if this patient comes in, the way I, I would liken this is if this patient comes in and someone, remember this is someone that's hypotensive, could be medical, could be trauma. We don't know what's going on. And I see this IVC, I can easily say, so this is a 35 year old female. She has fevers, urinary symptoms, very pyelonephritis like uh, uh, picture, right? And uh, she's tachycardic, you know, hypotensive. And I see this IVC, I can safely give her fluids and expect her to respond. Right, her IVC is collapsing. There's no doubt that they, her her venous system has the ability to respond. Right, meaning if we give her fluids, her blood pressure should improve and her heart rate should come down. Right, versus right, because when we we give fluids, it obviously goes into the venous system. Right, intravenous uh, fluids. Uh, so if we give this patient fluids, you can appreciate that if this patient's hypotensive, tachycardic and we put fluid in this system right here, it's probably not going to help, right? And so this is a good example of kind of how we use the IVC in the emergency department. If I see someone that's septic, right? So it's like think about a distributive shock, and I see this, like I'm going to have a much lower threshold for pressors, and I'm also not going to dump that 30 cc per kg fluid amount in that patient like this uh, because they're not going to respond whatsoever, right? Uh, and if I'm going to give them fluids, I'm not going to give them a large amount. I'm going to do like 250 aliquots or 500 cc aliquots. So this is kind of the way we use the IBC in the emergency department is kind of more of like, is this patient going to respond to fluids? You know, should I be more, uh, you know, quicker to pull for like vasopressors and stuff like that? given this patient's probably in, in, in a, in a uh, distributive shock-like picture. The same can be said for say someone, someone that's in, decompensated heart failure, right? So if you see decompensated heart failure, you see this big old IVC, you know, in conjunction with a systolic function that's decreased or depressed, you know, you can appreciate this patient is obviously probably hypervolemic and volume overload. So you might want to consider, you know, what you should do to stabilize them initially. And then obviously as you stabilize, you can die at least. Does that make sense? That's essentially the IVC. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Makes sense. Perfect. Good. And IVC is kind of, you know, it's debatable. Like some people use it, some people don't. Personally, in emergency department, I think it's by far the most, uh, has the most utility. And the reason that is, is because when people come into the emergency department, other than EMS, they haven't gotten a large amount of fluids or maybe no fluids, right? So at that point, it's kind of like the most raw data you can get versus by the time if you use the IVC analysis or IVC on ultrasound, in the ICU, the patient's already been through EMS, gotten probably two liters, through the ER, gotten two liters, you know what I mean? So it's it may not be as good of a tool compared to those you know patients in the emergency department where we can really use it to kind of uh, lead our management and make good clinical decisions based off of that IVC if there's any uh, respiratory variation. All right, so then we're gonna move to the M. This is Morrison's palp, so this is essentially the FAST. All right, so this is the lecture in, it, in its entirety, we'll go a little faster probably than I would have had a, just in a, a fast lecture, but this is uh, the fast lecture. All right, so windows, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and super pubic, right? So you remember uh, at the end of the day, these are your abdominal windows. The other windows are your cardiac window, which we already talked about, right? We know how to do a apical four. We know how to do a parasternal long, you know, and you obviously can even learn how to do a sub very easily. Uh, but nonetheless, in that situation, you're, you're only looking for pericardial effusion, which you guys are now experts in finding. So at this point, we can focus just on the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and the super pubic, and then we'll get to the lungs. All right, so here we go. Uh, so our ultrasound is going to go on to the patient's, uh, obviously, around the uh, mid-axillary line. Uh, you're going to have the indicator towards the axilla, uh, and this is the image you're going to be looking for. So if you look on the right side of the screen, that's a CT view. Uh, you can appreciate that the ultrasound is looking through the liver down into the kidney and the arrow is pointing at Morrison's pouch. So obviously that's the space in between the kidney and the liver as we are all uh, taught in med school. Uh, on the left is what the ultrasound depiction looks like. Uh, and if you can appreciate that, that's exactly what it looks like. And then it's just going to stand straight up. All right. 
Here, what they're doing with that ultrasound, which is an important motion, so that ultrasound comes in, you'll see they kind of drop down, right? Because we need to see that where the free fluid is going to pull is in between the liver and the kidney. So you really need to manipulate your probe. And so not only, it's not, a, it's not like a one-time 2D echo uh, that you can see all the, the fluid, right? You're going to need to look at the most anterior portion of the kidney and the most posterior portion. Obviously, the most posterior portion is where the fluid is most commonly found because it's you know gravity dependent. And these patients are coming in supine and mobilized in trauma. Uh, so it's very important to, to move your probe anteriorly, like fan it up and fan it down so you can get all aspects of that interface between those two organs. So here is uh, what you're looking for. So this the structure uh, obviously is the kidney in the middle, that's the liver to the left, and then the diaphragm is the hyperectolic line uh, off to the bottom left of the screen. And at the very bottom would be where the spine would be. All right, so we're going to highlight, so that's the diaphragm. That's the spine. This is where free fluid is. The red's obviously blood. So that's a hemothorax that's above the diaphragm, correct? So we're at the, obviously the, the head's off to the left of the screen, the feet are off to the right. Uh, so that's where free fluid would be. Uh, that's gonna be where uh, hemothorax would be. Uh, that marker up there at the top is important to note, which is, This one, right? And so that, that one right there at the top, that's where the free fluid is going to be. And it's most important to look, and I'll talk about why. All right, so this is uh, most important, probably slide when it comes to the fast. So this is the most sensitive pocket, uh, the right upper quadrant is. Uh, and that where that is highlighted is where the blood is going to initially uh, pool, right? And the reason that is, because that's the most posterior dependent pocket. Uh, it's actually not in between the interface, like where Morris and Powell. We always look into the spleen, or between the liver and the kidney. Uh, the most likely, not the most likely, but the most posterior dependent area is at the top. So you really want to make sure you depict the most caudal lobe in the liver uh, because that's where free fluid is going to pull first before it ever even comes down in between the interface of the, uh, the kidney and the liver. All right, so let's look. So here, uh, this is what we call spine sign. So this is basically, if you look at the right, so this image over here, this is the liver, this is the diaphragm, this is the spine. Uh, we don't see the kidney, so this is not, uh, we're not looking at the right upper quadrant. We're trying to depict here is basically what is normal and what's abnormal. So this is what we call mirror image artifact. This is normal, okay? And I won't tell you why, but just take my word for it. This is basically a mirror image of this, uh, this echogenicity here of the liver, and it uh, basically appears over here just as the mirror image artifact. And you guys can appreciate that that uh, spine abruptly stops at the level of the diaphragm, right? And so that's completely normal. Uh, let's see. So everybody can see that, right? So the diaphragm is right there, and the spine is abruptly stopping. Versus over here, this is the liver, and the spine's down here. Here's the diaphragm, and everybody can appreciate that the spine continues. It goes all the way down. Therefore, now the ultrasound echoes can come in, and they actually, now that we have flu, uh, free fluid down here in this lung, it can see it, so it picks it up. So it no longer shows image, image artifact. It actually picks it up, and so this is what we call spine side. All right, so this is telling me that the chemothorax or a total effusion, you know, something's going on in this right lower lung base here. Uh, so this is above the diaphragm, obviously, so this is the lung. So that's called spine sign. So just something to note when you're doing a, uh, a fast exam to always peer up into the, uh, you know, above the diaphragm just to make sure that you could appreciate a hemothorax or something of that nature in a patient. And remember, we're obviously doing this in a patient that's hypotensive. It may be trauma, maybe medical, you know, so this could be like a patient that's coming in that's, you know, hypotensive and hypoxic or whatever, and it could be a large pleural effusion. This is what that's going to look like. This fluid's going to be larger and you're going to see the lung flowing in that fluid. <laughs> So that's obviously a, a hemothorax. So this is normal. This would be abnormal, which is spine side. So what what tells the active image? We gotta we gotta see the diaphragm. We gotta see that most caudal lobe of the liver. Uh, and of course, lastly, you wanna see the the spine. All right. So what do you guys see? So here's the liver. Here's the kidney, the spine's down here. This is a little bit too, uh, we probably should increase our depth because we can't see the diaphragm. But does anybody appreciate this through here? Is this normal or abnormal? Abnormal fluid. Exactly, so that's a positive fast, right? So you can even see some up here, 
you know, so the most uh, dependent area is up here where the caudal lobe of the liver is. That's super important to see. But there's enough fluid posteriorly where it's basically pulling and it's coming all in the interface. So you can appreciate that's a positive fast. Good. What do you guys think? So this is the kidney. Once again, we should probably increase our depth. Diaphragm's over here. What do you, What is this all, all around this? It's all fluid, right? Good. Does this liver look normal or abnormal? If I'm Ab asking the question. Looks abnormal <laughs> to me. Good. If I'm asking the question, probably abnormal. So that's a cirrhotic liver, right? So y'all can appreciate that's a very shrunken liver. See the nodules? This is a, cir a cirrhotic liver, right? Shrunken. It's very nodular. There's no homogeny. Uh, so, and this is likely, that being said, this is probably ascites, right? So this is probably more ascites secondary uh, to the cirrhosis. So it's a lot of shrunken liver with a lot of ascites probably around it. Nonetheless, though, it doesn't look any different, right? So a cirrhotic patient gets in an MBA and they come in, sometimes it's, you know, it's clinical judgment on it that societies versus blood. There's no way to tell on ultrasound. There is a way to tell on CT with like Hansfeld units and stuff like that, but not on ultrasound. So what do you guys see here? Is this positive or negative? I would say positive. Any? Good. So it's positive up here, right? So you guys see this. This is a kidney. So you can appreciate this cellular fluid up here, right? So it's pulling up here and it's coming down in between the, the liver and the kidneys. So that's a positive fast. So that's the area that we have to see every single time. Super important. Positive or negative? Positive? Yeah, right there at the bottom, right? So you guys, you can appreciate, you can appreciate this right here, right? So that's a positive fast as well. So the free fluid, uh, just to, you know, you can see it just anterior to the kidney. Uh, and so that's free fluid all right there. So I can assure you that if we see that, uh, I can assure you that if we went up to the caudal lobe of the liver, there's going to be free fluid up here too. Good. So that's the right upper quadrant. So the left upper quadrant, from an anatomy standpoint, obviously it's the spleen, but once again, it's a large organ. It's a kidney, and it's the exact same except one thing that you have to learn of where to look. Other than that, it's a very similar approach. Uh, the only thing that we always like to think about is appreciate that uh, on that CT scan, we're now on the left side of the, the chest the abdomen, appreciate that the liver on the right, the, the kidney has not come in this, uh, come into view yet, right? So that tells you that that left kidney is more cranial, the right kidney is more caudal, which makes sense because the liver is so large, right? So the, it's going to push it down. So this is important when you go from the right upper quadrant. So if you're doing uh, the fast exam, you always go right upper, left upper pelvis. Uh, if it's penetrating trauma, you always start with the heart and then you do the abdomen, which we talked about. Uh, but just know that if you always start in the right upper quadrant, if you go directly across, it's not uncommon that you might be a little low and you might have to go up an intercostal space. Uh, and that's just because the left kidney tends to sit a little bit more cranial uh, than the right kidney given the liver. And this is a good depiction of that, right? So that right kidney is a little bit lower. So if you go straight across, you might be able to, uh, or you may not pick up a perfect uh, uh, view. So you might want to go up a, a intercostal space or two. But needless to say, the image is the exact same, right? So that's the diaphragm. That's where the uh, uh, free fluid will be. Or the, or sorry, that's depicting the free edge of the spleen, which is where the, the free fluid will begin. Uh, and then the only difference is where fluid collects. So obviously we asked the question because it's different. So when we look at the right upper quadrant, it's going to get the most caudal over the liver, and it's going to come all the way in between the space, which is Morrison's pouch, in between the kidney and the liver. On the left upper quadrant, though, they, we have the spleno-renal ligament, okay? So there's no potential space in between the spleen and the kidney. Therefore, the fluid's not going to collect there. That's depicting a hemothorax, and then that's going to depict all the circumferential. So you're going to have subdiaphragmatic blood. You're going to have at the caudal lobe of the spleen, uh, but you're not going to have any free fluid in between the spleen and the kidney. So that's super important to understand because if that's the only spot you're looking, you're going to miss it every single time, right? So that's super important compared to that right upper quadrant. That ligament is going to keep any blood from getting in between that space. So here's the kidney. Here's the spleen. Let's see if we see anything. <laughs> Does anybody see anything? No, it looks pretty normal to me. I concur. That's good. So that's a normal. That was a negative. Think 
Am I saying anything? Yes, I can respond. Right there. Good. Yeah. And this is a really, really, really good example of how you manipulate the probe, right? So we see the diaphragm, see the kidney, we see the spleen, right? If this is the only space we see, which we, I just told you, no free fluid is going to be there because that's spleen or renal ligament. But if you don't know what you're doing, you easily could cause this a false negative, right? So this person is uh, really appreciating subdiaphragmatically. So they're looking at the space underneath the diaphragm, which is negative. And then this rib, this shadow that comes down, that's a rib. It's in their way. They can't appreciate that free edge of that spleen. So they go down a rib space. And then they can appreciate now that exact space where they want to see the caudal over the spleen. And that's exactly what they're looking at there. And that's a positive. So this is an easy miss if you don't know what you're doing. So just always remember, go after that caudal over the spleen and the liver, because that's where that free fluid is going to be. Everybody can appreciate this here. That's positive. Obviously, same, right? All of this free fluid here, good example of no free fluid in between the kidney and the spleen, right? It's stacked down. So you appreciate all the free fluid subdiaphragmatic, subdiaphragmatically as well. So that overall, just remember always go knuckles to the bed. We teach that because of the uh, stomach. So this next one, you'll appreciate. Um, oh, actually, I thought it was a little bit further, but long story short, if you go a little bit more. Um, uh, mid axillary line on the left upper quadrant, you'll shoot across and you'll pick up the stomach. And so sometimes it'll depict obviously gas or free fluid, which is inside the stomach and it'll throw you off and it'll look like sometimes there's free fluid, like a positive. So you can get a false positive if you're, if you're not knuckles to the bed. So just be sure to go all the way. You're reaching across the patient with your right hand, knuckles all the way down to the bed, kind of looking up from the flank into that space of the left upper quadrant. And that way you'll you'll uh, miss the stomach or any of the free fluid in there. So you won't call it a false bottle. So you can appreciate that's what this is here. This is all this is all the stomach that's coming into to view. These are just tips, tips on the left upper quadrant and also on the right upper quadrant. So if you're doing the right upper quadrant, you rotate counterclockwise. So if your indicator is directly towards the axilla, it'll actually kind of pick up more rib, uh, rib artifacts because you're overlying ribs. If you just do a little bit of clockwise rotation outward, if you're in the right upper quadrant, if you're in the left upper quadrant, you do clockwise, a little bit outward rotation there as well. And you'll help your probe kind of really delve into that uh, intercostal space, which will eliminate some of the artifact that you'll pick up with the ribs. Oh, here's an example that I was looking for. So knuckles to the bed. So you can appreciate uh, if you start at that top there, uh, you can appreciate that you would pick up some of that uh, stomach there at the top, right? So they bring the probe down, and then that's that space you want to see the spleen and the kidneys. So that's super important. Uh, super pubic window. So we'll always start in the sagittal window. So the indicator is going to go towards the patient's head uh, rather than towards the patient's right. So we're going to start with the sagittal. You have a sagittal and a transverse so indicator towards the head. Uh, so here's the example of the, the left is the CT cut. So you can appreciate the, the uh, now sacrum and just anterior to the sacrum is the rectum anterior to that rectum is the uterus anterior to that is the bladder and just caudal to the bladder you can appreciate that hyperechoic or the white structure is hyperechoic so we're not talking ultrasound but that's the pubic synthesis all right so that's kind of the depiction uh, so if we put the indicator towards the head the yellow is the bladder the red is the uterus uh, and that's what we're looking at so on the right is the ultrasound finding uh, so free fluid as we know, as we're taught in med school, it's going to be uh, the pouch of Douglas, which is not this one. This is anterior, right? So this is above the uterus, uh, in between the uterus and the bladder, and then uh, posterior to the, the uterus is the pouch of Douglas. And so that's where your free fluid is going to collect in the sagittal view. <clears throat> so everybody can appreciate bladder. This is obviously free fluid. This is the uterus. This is free fluid, right? So this is the positive. That's the bladder. It's nice and circumscribed, contained. Versus this fluid is jagged. It's not contained. It's going to go anywhere it can, right? So it's going to get those jagged edges. Then you can see the uterus and then posterior to that, you see free fluid. This is a really good example of what we learn when people talk about like an antiverted and a retroverted uterus. So you guys can appreciate it. It's like this uterus is laying down in a recliner. So this is a retroverted uterus. If it was up here more, uh, that's an antiverted. So this is a good example of when you hear, I never really understood that until I started doing old shit and I saw this. I was like, oh, that makes more sense. But so if the, the uterus is flat and kind of laid back, that's more retroverted versus antiverted up here. All right, so this is the transverse view. So now we rotate the indicator to the right. So that red is where the free fluid, obviously it's gonna pull kind of this U-like shape. 
Uh, so you can appreciate this is the, the bladder here contained, circumscribed, fantastic. And then we see free fluid here, right? So there's some free fluid uh, on, on the circumferential aspects of that. So that's positive as well. So this is uh, a sad view again. Uh, it's not really a good view or a good look, but what it's depicting here is uh, a little bit of free fluid uh, just behind it, right? So you can see some free fluid here. You just gotta be careful on when oh, you're doing the sad view and stuff because sometimes you can get free fluid, of course, from the sidings and all different things. So you have to be careful to know exactly could it be free fluid from something else. <clears throat> that's normal. All right, so that's that's the fast. Any question? Uh, that's just the fast, right? We didn't do extended, so we didn't do the lungs, but that's the fast, so the right upper, left upper, and the super pubic, <clears throat> given we already did the heart. Any questions about that? No. No questions? Good. All right, so then we'll move on to the aorta. Uh, so this is obviously looking for an aortic dissection. This is the vertebral body. So remember, if there's a high calcium content or a ditch structure, your echoes are going to come in, you're going to hit the vertebral body, then you guys can appreciate how it's shadowing down here. So no echoes are getting past that. So that's the vertebral body. So just above that, obviously, is the aorta. The aorta sits right on top of the vertebral body. So this is what we call seagull signs. So this is like the celiac trunk, right? So the three branches of the aorta, the celiac trunk, the SMA, and the, the IMA. The two that we can really see, celiac trunk, we can see well in the transverse view. And in the longitudinal view, you can see the SMA that runs just one here and par parallel. Uh, with the uh, with the aorta, but this is the aorta. So what we're looking for here is an aortic uh, aneurysm. Okay, so does anybody know what a normal an or a normal aorta should be? Size? Just guess. Isn't it less than three centimeters? Perfect. So when in doubt, an ultrasound. If someone asks you a question, just say three. Don't say millimeters. Don't say centimeters. If you just say three, you'll be right about seventy-five percent of the time. Uh, so it's, yeah, so the aorta is less than three centimeters. Uh, and a good rule of thumb is the vertebral body of an average adult in width, like this isn't a good ultrasound, we're not getting a good, we're not picking up a good vertebral body here, uh, but the average width of a, a vertebral body of an adult is five centimeters. And that's very helpful because five centimeters is when it's a surgical emergency. If someone comes in, they're hypotensive, you throw the uh, ultrasound on their abdomen and look at their aorta. And the aorta is as large, if not larger, than the vertebral body. You can assure yourself that's a an aneurysm, and if they're hypotensive, obviously that's a ruptured aneurysm. So it's obviously a vascular emergency. You know that's where ultrasound really comes into help and it comes into play because that patient's likely not going to be uh, stable for the CT scanner. So you can make your diagnosis and get the vascular surgeons in immediately. Uh, so this is the vertebral body. That's the aorta. Obviously, this is off to the right. So this is the IVC. This is the liver here. This is the next one. Is the Sagittal view, so you can appreciate this long tubular structure. So all we did here is turn the indicator to the, excuse me, towards the head, just like if we're doing the IVC. Uh, and you can appreciate this structure. This is the SMA. If we had a clean structure, you'd see it jump off of the, uh, jump off the aorta and run, and it, it dives caudally and it runs in parallel to the uh, aorta. So that's the SMA, uh, and this is the uh, aorta. Obviously, what we're looking for in this view. Uh, is most importantly, you're looking for a dissection. So you'll see a flap, but you also don't want to miss like a saccular aneurysm, right? So sometimes when you're doing an aortic exam, let me go back. So here we're at the level of the liver. So this is kind of up towards like the, the sub xiphoid, right? So the upper abdomen. Uh, we're going to follow this aorta and do the upper abdomen, the mid abdomen, and you're going to go all the way down to the bifurcation. And you're going to follow the aorta all the way down, right? So the sub xiphoid all the way down, you know, until it bifurcates in the common iliacs. That's the only way you can truly roll out uh, aneurysm of the aorta uh, and just looking for something that's greater than three or obviously ruptured uh, if it's closer to like the five or more. Uh, and so that's super important. Uh, here, you can appreciate in the Sandville view, you're looking for like a saccular aneurysm because when you're doing an ultrasound, you're not always going to be able to follow the ultrasound from the sub xiphoid all the way down to the bifurcation. Sometimes there's going to be bowel gas and different issues. Uh, that might obstruct your flow. So you want to just make sure that if you do sagittal, you can appreciate a flap and a dissection or like a saccular aneurysm uh, that you could have easily missed if you might have uh, jumped over it as bowel gas might have been in your way. So what do you guys see here? Here's the vertebral body down here, right? So let me go back. Right, you guys can appreciate this structure here. This is the vertebral body. Still not perfectly crisp, but 
you know, this is the vertebral body. Do you guys see any abnormalities there? Yeah, looks like yeah. aneurysm. Yeah, of course, right? So this, this is the vertebral body. This thing is huge, right? It's dominating your screen, right? And so this is all hematoma and clot. You can appreciate this small little lumen down here, which is where the blood's still passing, right? But you can appreciate this large aneurysm there. Good. Same thing, right? So this is the vertebral body down here. This is large, definitely more than five centimeters. This is some hematoma and some clot, right? Sometimes you'll fool yourself and think, is this like a flap or something like that? You know, the odds of like an aneurysm and a dissection together is extremely unlikely. Uh, it's not impossible, uh, but nonetheless, the size tells us it's an aneurysm. Same thing, right? Vertebral body down here. You guys can see how large this structure is. There's a true lumen here where there's blood. This is all clot and hematoma. I would even beg to differ. The question is here, you see these like hyperchoic space, hyperchoic space. You guys can appreciate that. So not uncommon to see that in like calcifications of the aorta. It'd be curious to see if it goes all the way around. Because if this goes all the way around, it's like a penetration like where it's like hyperchoic space. It almost makes me think that this patient have like a graft. You know, is this like a filled graft or something that they previously had that's now, you know, it has an aneurysm in conjunction. But just something to look for. You can really appreciate previous graphs and stuff that uh, people have had secondary to uh, or uh, like an operative and, uh, aortic aneurysm. All right, so pipes. This is lastly, uh, we looked at the uh, aorta. Uh, DVT, we're not going to go over only because the DVT doesn't cause hypotension. Some will teach it, but for me, I'm not worried about it. We can come back and do another lecture on DVT if you guys would like to. Uh, and then lastly is PS pulmonary. So this is the uh, looking at the uh, lung windows, right? So pneumothorax. So this is what we always learn in med school. Uh, so you put the ultrasound uh, indicator in the middle of the chest uh, and the indicator, sorry, the uh, second intercostal space uh, over the lung, like mid clavicular line, sorry. Second intercostal space indicator towards the head. And this is what's going to be depicted. So this here is a rib. It's casting a shadow. Here's a rib that's casting a shadow. This is the intercostal space here. Super important to have a rib on either side because we're appreciating the lump sliding left and right in between, right? We can't see anything. Obviously, there's nothing we can see past the rib because of the calcium content and the density. Uh, and appreciate that sliding, right? So we see nice sliding left and right, right? Antenna log, glistening, glittering. Everybody will call it all different stuff, but essentially that's lung sliding. So that's good and adequate. We have, a, uh, obviously, that lung is aerated and moving air just fine. These here are called A-lines. So you guys can appreciate these are equal distance apart. Uh, those are called A-lines. It's basically a, an artifact that we see. And if you think about it, they're completely normal physiologic. Uh, and we remember think about like A-OK. -okay. So A is like, obviously the, the A, if you're drawing an A, and then the horizontal line is the straight line. Uh, and so it's horizontal. So A-OK, -okay, that's completely normal. And that's important, I'll tell you why. Uh, so you can actually appreciate, do y'all see any movement on this lung at all? Do y'all see any left or right movement here? Or does that look pretty steel? Pretty steel. Pretty steel. Good. I agree. It's steel, right? So that's, that's the pneumothorax, right? So there's no movement there, right? So you can appreciate, see how there's movement and then there's no movement. There's no movement over here, but there's movement here. This is called a lung point, right? So lung point is pathognomonic for a pneumothorax. So this is essentially exactly where the pneumothorax, the pneumothorax begins, right? So you can see lung sliding, and all of a sudden it abruptly stops, and there's no lung sliding. So that's exactly where the point of the pneumothorax begins. So that's super helpful to know. Uh, some people will ask me, you know, in this lecture, it's like, oh, well, can you figure out where the other lung point is? You, I mean, you could. You know, but at the end of the day, remember that it's not that important, right? We're really just trying to look for a pneumothorax. Okay, yes, this patient has a pneumothorax, and clinically, you're going to make the decision if, you know, they need a thoracostomy, like a chest tube, right? If they don't, you're going to medically manage it and medically manage it and go from there. Uh, but this is, you know, something that you're not going to be able to use an ultrasound to uh, obtain the size of a pneumothorax. You're really just looking for the pneumothorax by itself. And then lastly, lung, uh, the lung windows for B lines. So I talked about A lines, right? So these are A lines. These are completely normal, right? So these left to right lines, uh, that's all normal. So this is a rib shadow, rib shadow. We can appreciate the, uh, the movement left to right. Uh, and so you also notice that we're, uh, we're not using a linear probe. So a lot of times when you're looking for a pneumothorax, you use a linear probe when you're looking for more like interstitial lung syndrome, which is like pulmonary edema and stuff of that nature. 
you're going to use a curvilinear probe. Uh, and so here you can appreciate that this is a, a linear or a curvilinear probe. Uh, this is not a linear, so it's got a little bit more curvature to it, and we're a little bit deeper, right? So we're like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight centimeters or so. Uh, and this is where we want to look for like pulmonary edema. So we don't see any B lines. We don't see any vertical lines other than our rib shadows. If I click to the next one, though, you guys can all appreciate this. It looks like a disco party, right? You see all these lines going left and moving left and right, and they're going to the bottom of the screen. These are called B lines. So if you think about the B, B stands for bad, and the straight line of a B is a vertical, right? So this is B lines. This is basically a sign of some type of interstitial syndrome, most commonly, of course, pulmonary edema. Uh, this is also, if it's asymmetric, you want to look for this in like a patient that has like pneumonia. So if you see a patient that has like B lines in one focal aspect of the lung, and then the other aspects of the lung are clear, you could diagnose a, a um, uh, pneumonia that way. But if it's non-discriminatory bilateral, that would be consistent with pulmonary edema. So you can appreciate that this was very, lung ultrasound was very helpful there in the COVID era because we weren't wanting to get x-rays on a regular basis over and over. Uh, and so you can really appreciate uh, using the ultrasound because this is dynamic, right? So if this patient is hypotensive, secondary to cardiogenic shock, and they have all this interstitial lung syndrome, secondary to pulmonary edema, and I give them Lasix and I go and scan them like the next day, you know, these B lines will start to clear up, right? Versus x-ray takes obviously 24 to 48 hours, you know, to appear and to change. And so a lot of times you can dynamically watch this over uh, a day-to-day -day period in the ICU for like COVID and stuff like that was very helpful. Uh, so this is what that looks like on a lung ultrasound. So if you think about, you see someone with a decreased EF and then you see this, uh, so you look at the, the heart, it's got poor systolic function. Then you put the ultrasound on there chest and you see these all these B lines, you know, and someone that doesn't have a history of heart failure, you just diagnose that patient with heart failure. Or you say that someone that has heart failure, but they're normally preserved, you know, and their EF is usually say 45, 50%, but you put the ultrasound on their chest, you do that long axis ultrasound, you see how it's like 50, 15%. You see that golf clap and then you see this on the lungs, you obviously know they have decompensated heart failure. That's it. Any questions? I know it was a lot, uh, but I will say overall, I think uh, this lecture tends to be far more helpful when it comes to a lot of the other things that we like to talk about. So here, I was just seeing what other were uncovered. So this is like that seashore sign that you learn in med school, right? So if we remember, uh, you can put the end mode cursor down and so you can get the, the seashore. Uh, which is what this looks like, right? So if you put the end mode, this is what we are seeing. Uh, and then this is what it looks like. So it's like the sand, the ocean, and the, the sky. So I'm sure you guys have heard of that. <clears throat> Any questions about anything, guys? Dr. Hill, thank you so much for giving this really in-depth talk and presenting all this to us. Um, I know this is like something we don't get really at Ross. So we're very grateful for you to take the time to give us this talk tonight. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to do it. Like I said, you know, uh, you guys have my contact or you can get it. Katie has my, my, my number. She has my email. So feel free if you guys ever, you know, uh, especially those that are on the cusp of, you know, applying. Uh, if you have questions, you know, in regards to your application or the process or anything, just please feel free to, you know, to reach out to me, I'm more than happy, uh, you know, to help any way I can, you know, uh, I, I've been in your shoes, I was very fortunate and grateful for the opportunity I was given and where I am now, so uh, I know it takes a lot, and so I obviously want to help everyone, you know, the best of my ability, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome, well, I'll share your information, and yeah, thank sure. you guys all for showing up tonight and participating, and um Again, thank you, Dr. Hill, and I hope everyone has a great night. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thank you so for much. putting us on, Dr. Thank Hill. Thank you. I, mean, I learned a ton in two hours, so thank you for your time. <laughs> yeah, probably probably too much, but I, like I said, it's hard to, to stop, right? It's hard when I'm teaching to say, okay, this is the right place to stop for a novice learner. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm on the mentality of always, like, I want to know a little bit more, and so... I think a lot of times it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose early on, but I uh, I always like giving a lecture just to say, hey, people are going to hear it one time, two times. It's, it's going to take a lot. Ultrasound's a, a steep learning curve, uh, you know, but the fact that you guys are getting exposed, getting educated, getting to see what, it, you know, how it can be used, 
uh, is far more than where I was in your shoes. So, so don't think that it's impossible to to go into the residency and you're going to be ahead of the game. So super, super helpful to, to get educated now rather than later. Uh, so you guys are ahead of the curve for sure. Yeah, I feel like uh, imaging is not something we get a lot of training in as a medical student. So x-rays, CTs, all that included, we don't really get a lot of instruction on that. You kind of have to figure that out as you yeah. go through clinicals. Yeah, I've actually, I did reach out. So I still have some connections at Ross. I've reached out uh, <clears throat> and offered my time. Uh, I wouldn't say free of charge. Like I, I wouldn't, I know I don't really care to get paid as long as I can pay for my flight, but I've offered to find a way to integrate into the curriculum in, in Barbados. Uh, I know they said they had someone and I was like, all right, well, sounds good. And I kind of just stay in my lane now. I'll just give back to the EM folks. And, and uh, but nonetheless, I, I definitely have a passion, you know, for teaching. And most importantly, I know most medical schools don't have it integrated, you know, so for Ross ever was able to develop something like that, uh, you know, it'd be tremendous. Uh, but I do know, I think it's probably most applicable in third and fourth year where you're really getting exposed to the hands-on opportunities. Uh, and you guys are obviously stateside. So I even, you know, I've talked, we've talked before about finding a way to, you know, put on workshops and stuff like that. But it, you know how it is with Ross. It's academics at its finest. Everything moves at a snail's pace. Uh, I kind of hit some walls and I gave up. And then I moved to Texas and took this job.